Hello everyone, I'm Brian, and today we're going to continue on with Neuroscience David Inkelman with Sad Guru Part 3. Alright, let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> Not a work donkey. I'm trying to understand this issue about knowing. So, where we clearly have overlap in the way we go about it is wanting to know things, wanting to understand everything around us. But there's a, there's a sense in which we're not limited by our intellect because um, I have the opportunity to ride on the back of all the other humans on the planet and those that have come before me. It's a collective intellect that's now encoded on Wikipedia and in millions <laughs> of books. Wikipedia. And I have an opportunity to take experiences from across the world, places I've never been, ideas that I would have never thought of and so on and feed all that in. So it's a much richer diet First of all, a much richer data. It's a diet of data. I no. mean, it's what shapes my next thoughts. Is what I've taken in. No, it's it is just that today we have access to much larger data than maybe hundred years ago. All right, mm -hmm. but still, we've already looked at this. It's still a minuscule, isn't it? I agree. Compared to the whole cosmos, still minuscule, but it's moving in the right direction. The the unslakeable thirst for knowledge that humans have means that there's this ratcheting up each generation. So it's not that I'm, l it is of course the case that I'm limited in my thoughts to the impressions that I've had, but I have a much bigger fire hose of impressions now that can build on the scaffolding of the generations before me, the things they've already figured out, so that I can start at the next, at the next level and but move start up. Start at the next level for what? Towards what end? Yeah. Towards what end? <coughs> I don't, hmm, I do believe there is an end to this knowledge and to, how do I say, the physical knowledge? What I mean by that is what science can discover. Now what Sadhguru is talking about, I think, in my opinion, is something that science cannot really put down. I mean, we know that when we feel a certain emotion, certain parts of our brain triggers. So we know whenever you feel happiness, this part of the brain triggers, and you feel sadness, this part of the brain triggers. But that's what scientists can figure out. But I think the problem is with what said Guru would be saying is that, sure, you can keep constantly poking that part of the brain and constantly making that person happy, but it's not going to be real happiness. I don't know why I said Sadhguru would say that, but it's something along the lines of what he's saying, and I, I think that's what they're getting along. That's the reason why I was a bit confused and why would a uh, <clears throat> Sadhguru talk to a neuroscientist, because they're, they're talking about two different things, kinda. One deals with what science cannot deal with, and one deals with what science knows and is trying to know. There is, I think there is a limit to what science can do, but we are quite far from that. Um. That's a good question. I mean, it's it's the toward the end of, of knowing. knowing. Uh -huh. yeah, basically, once we know everything, I have a feeling. I don't know. My and my thoughts are: once we know everything, if that's even possible, it might be very sad, because there's no more guesswork in life. There's no more mysteries in life. In the way that, in the way that science cares about knowing. So putting aside usefulness of technology, just the way that scientists ask questions. Uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist oh said, God. <laughs> science is like oh. sex. Sometimes something useful comes out of it, but it's not why we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a way of knowing. And it's a way of, uh, it's a collaborative way of knowing where we link arms across space and across generations as well to try to get somewhere. I'm in no way trying to disagree with that or uh, in any way discredit that. It's yeah. a tremendous effort. But I'm saying if knowing is the purpose, because wanting to know how much time and energy somebody is willing to dedicate to that may be questionable from person to person. Uh -huh. but everybody <coughs> wants to know. There's no question about that. Uh -huh. But knowing everything by intellect, we will know the surface of everything but never the real source of everything or the core of everything. Holy crap, did he just say what I just said? Basically like poking a brain, like I, I can make someone happy by uh, 
sending shocks to this particular part of the brain, but that's not going to generally truly make you happy. Maybe he said it. He said it differently. It doesn't quite match up. But it does in my head a little bit. Because the only piece of the only doorway to our experience is this human mechanism. You don't know the world any other way than the way this one is projecting right now within itself. Yes. Agreed. There is no other way. You don't know how that is. You only know the way it is happening within you, isn't it? I don't know how you are really. I only know the way your picture is right now projecting in my brain <laughs> or my system and how I am perceiving it. As you know, you have drilled holes into people's brains and impact something, something <laughs> and put electric current and whatever <coughs> you've done. I'm not saying you as a person, I'm saying these things have been done. Uh, you definitely know by interfering with a certain physical process, the whole perception could change. The world has not changed, but perception has changed, so in his experience everything has changed. So that dimension of life is only useful for survival. Hmm. He keeps going back to the survival thing. I, I kind of understand it. It goes back to I think what I said earlier with Darwinism, like how in order to survive, in order to continue to your species to survive, you have to be the best at surviving in your particular condition. So basically, again, I, I said this earlier about if even if you're the strongest creature out there, if strength is not the requirement to survive and intellect this, you will die and the weaker, more intelligent one will survive. <clears throat> like uh, um, animals, uh, I'm sorry, sea creatures deep down in the seas has very particular body structure that enables them to survive down there. It's not arms and legs or just fish in general, you know, they can survive in the sea much better than we can because we can't really breathe underwater. So basically, the, our body is create. Well, our body is, is adapted in a way that we are capable of surviving in the conditions that we're in. That's, well, that's the way survival. I'm interpreting that. Everything that we're doing is survival. Yes, absolutely. To survive better, to enhance our survival to a better status or in an enhanced way of survival process. But once you come as a human being, it doesn't matter how well you survive. Still, it is not good enough, isn't it? Ah, <laughs> so basically, I think in that one point, it's just basically just surviving is not good enough because we've already accomplished just surviving and there's, I guess, much more to do. It's never going to be good enough because survival is not going to fulfill a human being. It doesn't matter how big our homes get, how big our cars get, how energy efficient it gets, <laughs> how better we dress, how better we eat. Still, we will feel it's, it's not, not enough. enough. Talk to a rich person, or a lot of rich people. I mean, not all rich per people, but there are a lot of rich people out there that are they have it all, but somehow they're still depressed and they're not happy. It's so weird to say that. Because that's not the direction in which the life wants to go. So here's the part I'm trying to understand is this issue about knowing, this issue about seeking knowledge. Let's say um, either in science... Oh boy, I thought he went rewind back to the very beginning. Did he just say that? Or in mysticism. We depend on our senses for that. But this is different yes. right here. Or are you saying that I'm saying they're not dependable. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. They're not dependable. <laughs> but isn't it all we have? Or you're saying there's this other yes. aspect to the mind. See, see for example, suppose you or me were lost in the jungle as infants, okay? If something edible came, we definitely would take it and put it in the mouth. We wouldn't try our ears fast, <laughs> and, nostrils and, then, and then by accident discover the mouth. No, we just know how to eat. No question about that. So I'm saying that. Is, yeah, that is kind of true when you think about babies. Babies are always stuffing stuff in their mouths, <laughs> whether it's edible or not. Everything concerned with our survival is inbuilt. It's there. This is millions of years of memory, which is there within us. We know how to survive. But we wouldn't know how to read, we wouldn't know how to do so many other things which have become a part of our life. This is weird. It's talking about the basic essentials that we need, which is something I talk about, how people are not happy with just having food, roof, and 
Well, that's pretty much it. Like having a shelter and having food, that's the basic essentials that you need to survive, to live and to be happy. Of course, you want to make a little bit more to make sure that once you get old, you can retire. Do you remember when you were two or three years of age when they tried to t teach you that alphabet, the damned A, how complicated it was? It was so complicated just to get it right. You had to write hundred times to get it. Today with eyes closed you can do it because of a certain striving, isn't it? Similarly, anything beyond survival, if we have to have it in our lives, a certain striving is needed. As I said, striving for inward perception huh. is something, unfortunately, that's been banished in modern, modern societies because we are on the thrill of technology. I hope he's gonna say something that really means a lot to me. Well, <clears throat> that I something that I say, not necessarily that it means a lot, but it's one of the core, I guess, maybe core beliefs that I have. It's, it's, uh, it's something I talk with my friend where basically, you know, people out here are, uh, some people out here are complaining they don't make enough money even though they're spending so much money on advanced technology, fancy cars, and are not really spending that money on better shelter or better food, and they complain about it. They don't need all these fancy stuff to survive. They just need a good house. They need to prioritize shelter and, and food. And then just get a car to get you from point A to point B that's reliable. But a lot of people complain that, you know, want fancy cars, fancy food, fancy technology, fancy everything. Hey, don't, don't get me wrong. I am all about the fancy technology here, but I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure that I'm okay first and foremost, and then look at the technology stuff. It's a fantastic thing, but you will see as time progresses, as technology becomes better and better, human beings will become more and more frustrated. If you have not noticed Oh yes, again, oh, I'm sorry I keep pausing it, but he just makes such, he makes the points that I, I keep thinking on an everyday basis. Like, again, you look at America, people here, we, we don't have bad neighbors necessarily. You know, we have really good neighbors by comparison to a lot of countries. And we have it, American people have it so good that we have to start internal fights. I'm wondering if that's Rome collapsed within more than uh, the invading armies because there's so much corruption internally. And in the United States, it feels like not there's always going to be corruption, but it's because we have it so easy, so good, and we have the, even the poor people over here actually have it so much better than a lot of other poor peoples around the country. And we're still not happy. It's really weird. We are a rich country. I, I don't know if we're the richest. It's irrelevant. It's the fact that we are still rich. We are still living in a good life, whether it's be number one or number one hundred. It doesn't matter if you're if most of your citizens living good, but we're still complaining. It's we're never going to be happy, and that's what he's saying. And that just that's what it stuck to me whenever he said that. This, just look out and see. You will see eight-year-old, ten-year-old kids bored. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get like a little frustrated. I didn't get really frustrated, it's just, it's just the point, it's like, yes! <laughs> sorry. <laughs> In your generation or my generation, we would have never seen, we never knew what is damn boredom is. Yeah, because there's too much when to do. When you were eight or ten, you were just bubbling with life and on. But today you see, ten-year-old kids are just bored with it because they've seen the damn cosmos through their phone screen. <laughs> they know it they all. They know it all. Yep. And that's what I was saying earlier, I think once we discover everything, life might be just miserable because there's nothing else to know, there's no more mystery to discover, it's just we know everything. And I, that's why I'm saying it might be a sad life once we do. I always have fun learning like this, I love watching his videos and his talks, it's just reinforcing a lot of things that I believe, which is great. And there are some things that he points out that just, that I already knew, but I didn't know, it just subconsciously knew and he just just brought it out of me. <laughs> so I'm saying all this excess. I didn't mean to get so excited. <laughs> to betterment of life, and it will not. Comfort and convenience will come. But well being will not happen. The purpose of enhancing human experience on this planet will not happen. It will only entertain us intellectually big time, which it is. No question. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm saying it's limited. Maybe the thing 
that allows people to make a deeper pursuit be in exactly the analogy with the uh, idea of building schoolhouses throughout the country. It would have been 30 years ago that it would be difficult for you to speak to many people, but now you have 500,000 followers on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. as, I was, as I was telling you, I was in a very large uh, gathering of people and somebody asked me, Sadhguru, what about all the gurus, ancient gurus who were there, what about them? I said, nothing, nothing. I am the greatest guru <laughs> because <laughs> when Krishna was there, he could speak to… he was a gentle, very gentle human being, probably he could speak to fifty people at a time. When Gautama came, he stood up and spoke more loudly. Maybe hundred people, Vivekananda came, he had a big voice, maybe he speak, spoke to two hundred people. Look at here, right now I am speaking to fifty thousand people and if I want I can speak to the whole world sitting here. So I am the greatest guru ever <laughs> because technology has definitely facilitated that, no question. But at the same time, technology doesn't have discriminatory powers. Uh -huh. You can… as you can deliver well-being, you can deliver disaster through technology. Yes, technology, no matter what it, what it is, can always be used for good or bad. <sighs> and I guess it goes back to me saying that, you know, you live your life how you want. Hopefully you live your life for the better, at least at the very least for yourself and not to cause anyone else harm, that at the very least. And then if you want to do better, to make life better for the people around you. By itself, it doesn't have a mind Like of using technology own, for good. And all machines and whatever we have created technology, from a bicycle to a spacecraft or a computer or whatever, essentially only what we can do, enhancement of that. Because we can speak, now a microphone has come, a telephone has come. Because we, we can see a telescope has come, a microscope has come. Only what we can do, we are enhancing it with various machines and gadgets we are creating. We have not created one machine or gadget to do something that we ourselves cannot do in a rudimentary way. I agree with uh -huh, that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I am saying your own… All we're… The, the technology, all it does is it enhances our abilities to do things. It doesn't make us good or bad, all it does is it enhances our capabilities. Only enhancing your five senses. For can... now, yes, but no, it as can, you know… See, right now, it can happen. Right now, with a phone, I can uh, talk to somebody in India. It may… technology may come, I can smell the food that they're cooking <laughs> in India if I'm missing home. <laughs> Call up the guy, can you put on the food? I can smell the food from India, it <laughs> yeah. may happen. I'm not saying it's beyond that, it's very much possible it may happen. But I can do it without a phone also. You cook it at home. So, you're very interested in inner engineering. My interest is in outer engineering. And as yeah. you know, uh, I've built a vest in my laboratory with vibratory motors on it. And we're experimenting now with feeding in new kinds of data streams into the brain because the hmm. brain appears to be flexible enough to take in any kind of new data streams and have a sensation of it. So, so if I feed in weather patterns from the surrounding 200 miles, or if I feed in real-time stock market data, you can, in theory, develop a sense of the economic movements of the planet, things like this. Now, we're just at the foot of the mountain on this, but it may be that there are whole new kinds of human senses, and that would be a proof of principle of developing something that goes that goes beyond, that makes a new kind of sense, it essentially takes these peripheral devices and adds, adds new ones and eventually we'll probably build new kinds of sensors and plug them right into the brain. Oh, I was talking about, about the, uh, oh god, I can't remember that video, it's about the nine, gosh, sorry, I can't remember, I have terrible memory. That's one thing, I need a computer chip in my brain for memory. <laughs> I have one megabyte of memory, so pardon me, guys. Um, the one video where it, I, talk, I, talk, I think it talks about the nine, uh, nine evolutions of human, humankind in Hinduism. And in the last one, I, I was thinking maybe the tenth one is implementing uh, technology into our bodies. Cyborg, I believe, would be the right word. Still, they will only enhance your present capabilities, not something new. I'm thinking so, yeah. Not entirely new. 
I don't know. If I could actually have a, an individual experience of weather patterns 200 miles wide as I'm walking around, I'm, I'm tapped into that. I think that's a new human experience. It's not I'll something tell you, This is something that happened almost 40, 45 years ago. Okay, before he answers that, I'm thinking it's like, well, you're, you're still, whether you feel the weather five feet from you or 45 miles from you, it's the same experience, just a matter of the length. Ago, ...when I was living on a farm. So there is a man, a middle-aged man in the village who is, uh, you know, he can barely hear, 95 percent gone, just if you shout at him, he hears. <laughs> so because Sorry, he I don't know why I laughed. Hear, he cannot say anything, he just down and stares at things. So everybody thinks he's a fool and you know, things happening, he's not valued in the village. So I huh. took him as my man Friday and I said, you stay on my farm and work for me. So he was with me. What I found was one morning he gets up. He can sense he the weather plow, better. And the, you know, those were the days, not tractor days, we still plow with the animals. So he gets the animals and the plow ready. I said, what are you doing? He said, to, I'm getting ready to plow. I said, where, where are you going to plow? It's dry. Uh, is he sh I just imagine him just screaming into his ears, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, it's going That's to why rain I was today. laughing. I look at the sky, it's clear sky. I said, nonsense, where is it going to rain? He said, no, it's going to rain. He simply sits there like this because nobody, no social communication, he can't hear. He simply sits there like this the whole day. If there's no work, he just sits in one place unmoving and he just knows and you won't believe it'll rain. The day he says it'll rain, it will rain. Then I sit up, okay, I'm doing all this yoga, I'm not getting this, this guy. <laughs> so I sat there day after day, day after day, turning my hand like this, turning like this, trying to feel this, trying to feel that, feeling the earth, looking up, looking down, everything. I applied myself for eighteen months and today, in tropical climate, with my eyes closed, I will say, today it's going to rain means ninety-five percent it's going to rain. It's just a keener observation of everything, that's all. Yes. You, you just… Sh because he could not hear, he just sharpened the other aspects uh -huh. so much. And so that's something I talked about, like if you lose one of your senses, I've heard that your other sensor gets hyped up. I don't know whether the power that goes into your eyes if you go blind gets diverted to your other senses or just your other sensor gets extra hype and because you lost a sense. He Could mean both the same thing. And always. Bang, bang on. on. Maybe he had one of my vests on. <laughs> <laughs> Possible. But he was not sparkling like you. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious on a completely different topic. When you look at other faith traditions, hmm. when you look at the uh, the the rabbi, sages, and imams, and people all over the world of different um, traditions, what do you see in common? The common is… Uh, they all what do you see in common? A belief in a God that you must follow the scripture in order to go to heaven or you go to hell. I believe something that they don't know. Hmm. God, right? Because I think the main reason why every human being is not a natural seeker is they have not realized the immensity of I do not know. <clears throat> Sorry, I keep pausing it a lot, but just I, I, so exciting because the I don't know. When in the past, I think, again, this is my personal opinion based on the things I've watched throughout the entirety of my life and something that I believe human beings would do and the a logical reason why they would, we seek to understand things. We seek to know things. We cannot have something that we do not know for very long because it will scare us. The unknown is very scary. So when you apply logic to it, whether it's illogical or not, but it's logic at the time, for example, thunderstorms, we created Zeus or whatever god or gods or single, whatever, just god or gods out there. And it, it says, okay, that's the reason why it's thunderstorming. I feel better now. As opposed to saying, I don't know why it's thunderstorming, it's scary, and, you know, try to, try to figure out the real answer. 
they just put an answer to something to calm people down because again the fear of the unknown is really great it is i think the most terrifying thing for human beings more terrifying than maybe even death itself if you see i do not know the possibility of knowing arises longing to know arises seeking to know arises mm -hmm. then knowing becomes a possibility and a reality everything that you do not know if you just believe you destroy the possibility of knowing all yeah but belief is a because you don't need to know anymore because you already know into a human being makes him far more sure footed than others but confidence without clarity is very disastrous both for the individual and the larger humanity and the planet itself see suppose let's say my vision is not clear it is but i'm just <laughs> suppose my vision is not clear i want to walk through you but i can't see clearly but i'm very confident can be pumping into people you know what a disaster i will be for you <laughs> all right if i understand my vision is not clear and i don't have this foolish idea of confidence then i will walk gently i'll seek somebody's help i'll have some humility to walk through people in a certain way otherwise i will see how to clear my vision what i have to do for that but if you have no clarity and you have confidence it's a dangerous it's a it's dnt it's bound to explode on humanity somewhere it keeps happening here there we are just looking at eruptions small eruptions but it's bound to happen somewhere large scale but at the same time as human intellect is sparkling like never before for the first time in the history of humanity more human beings are thinking for themselves uh -huh. than ever before all these thousands of years one village or one town with a few thousand people means only one guy would think yeah. others would just take instructions <coughs> mm -hmm. that follow yeah. now almost everybody is able to think how clearly how uh, how much how much clarity or confusion is a different thing but at least they think okay okay there you go it's okay yeah so i was going to say yeah we have this technology information is out there you can do your research but even with all this technology we have to get all this information people will still hyper focus or want to um believe in the things they want to believe and find facts on the things they want to believe and discard the rest we have so much information out there so much science and tech well just science facts and research people still want to believe what they want to believe and in a sense they're not thinking for themselves i mean kind of but as this evolves I believe in the next 50 to 100 years as more and more human beings start thinking for themselves then you will see believing in something will be completely out of vogue because essentially believing something means with with all you respect to everybody essentially believing something means you are not sincere enough to admit that you do not know Sorry, I have to pause it there and just take that in. Believing in something means that you're not sincere enough to admit that you do not know. Whew, man, I need that on a shirt. Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. Believing in something means you are not sincere enough to admit you do not know. I will say scientists will say differently, but. belief in terms of a belief as opposed to a hypothesis i think are two different things so yeah oh man i need that on a shirt <laughs> we all have to come to this much what i know i know what, what i don't do know, know no, i don't I do know. know this is a fantastic way to be and i do not know person cannot fight with anybody that's the biggest thing wait and uh, and i don't know person cannot fight with anybody that's the biggest thing okay i know always there is a fight oh ah, yeah so all this yes yes processes which have ended up as religions at one time when they started started as an individual experience for somebody that person shared his experience with a few people around him maybe a dozen or maybe a hundred or maybe a few thousand he shared and over a period of time it gets organized and becomes something totally totally different so it has a huge 
responsibility of handling psychological well-being of the human beings in the sense See, human beings are psychologically always confused <laughs> and they don't know where to be, what is their well-being and for every small thing there is confusion, you know. I will say this, <clears throat> like, uh, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a believer of any religion, although I will say I do favor Buddhism so far and Hinduism is growing because it seems like a, a it, it grew out of Hinduism, but it's the thing that I learned first. Or uh, it's the first thing that my teacher, my world religious teacher taught that just really had a very big impact on me. I don't follow it as a religion, but I do follow, I do take into what it says that really stuck to me, which was life is suffering, childbirth is pain. Whenever, whenever the thing I thought about childbirth at first was joyful. People are generally happy when you have a child, but it's suffering, actually suffering, sorry, was, that's what she said. I believe, I believe she might've been Hindu um because you know she had the uh the normal indian garb and along with the the dot uh, the uh, i can't remember what they call that but the dot in the forehead is the best way i can describe it but yeah whenever uh, and then i don't know that really just stuck with me really really hard and um oh god i was going somewhere with this <laughs> i went off topic oh Regardless of what you believe, I mean, if it makes you a better person, then by all means, do it. I don't... If it makes you a better person, whatever it takes, do it. You I'll just leave it at that. Where to be, what is their well-being, and for every small thing there is <clears throat> confusion, you know. It's something that I realized when I went to the university. I, I refuse to, I'm sorry, I, I'm speaking in university. <laughs> I refused to sit in the classrooms because it was too uninteresting for me. So I sat in the garden outside under a tree. Once I planted myself there, everybody knew that I am there every day without fail, under the tree. <laughs> Where all kinds of debates and discussions we started and people started coming to me with all kinds of problems. You know, students having their own problems, uh, their education problems, boyfriend, girlfriend <laughs> problems, parental problems. As I sat there and I heard through everybody's everything, in these three years that I was there, I must have heard thousands of people about their problems. What they teach you in school is not about life. That's what I believe he's really good at. He's very wise in that matter in terms of handling problems. Again, problems that science cannot solve. Science is very fact-based. Fact and humanity itself is not fact-based. Uh, to say that how you talk to your parents, how you feel about your parents, that's not fact-based. You know what you like and what you don't like. That's different for everyone, so there's there's no saying doing this will make it make you happy because it's not uh, it, there's different things for different people that's the reason why science cannot handle issues like that and that's why I, I like him because his 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 wisdom will help you in life become a better person will ease your your anxiety i mean instead of i don't know people just can't handle themselves i'd like to think i can and i think i can i've done it mostly so far but uh, obviously, I, I know I've probably, I, I'm sure I have gotten frustrated many times. <laughs> but I, I always try to think things through, I always calm myself down after that. I, I think it logically through why I'm doing that and whatnot. It became like a problem point. Anybody has a problem, they come to me. I realized I was the only Frico who did not have a problem. Frico? Everybody had a problem, which made them normal. I, I didn't know uh, it's a problem. It's not that everything was perfect, but it's just that I didn't view it as a problem. I just saw situations are there, some works for me, some don't work for me. But everybody mm -hmm. has a problem. If you really look at it, the problem with humanity is just this. From a… from being a monkey or a chimpanzee to a human being, it's actually a small change, you know. From… from a chimpanzee to a human being, there's only 1.23 percent DNA difference, hey, I believe. He knows that not much? not much, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you could forget sometimes who we are. <laughs> but oh gosh. what a phenomenal change in the intelligence that we have compared to a chimpanzee or a monkey. So the problem Hopefully is I'm not this, too loud, we I'm have sorry. this intellect which is sharp and we don't know how to hold it. 
Whichever way we touch it, it cuts us. All the suffering, human suffering on the planet is manufactured in their own mind. From outside, how much suffering is happening, do you tell me? Nothing much, it's all generated, it's all self-help. Mm. This is because this evolutionary process has happened so rapidly. As Charles Darwin went about describing, a goat became a giraffe, it took many million years, a pig became an elephant, many, many million years, but from monkey to man it happened rather quickly, to a point where people think there is a missing link somewhere, okay <laughs> So quickly that we have still not gotten used to this intelligence. We are struggling as to how to manage this intelligence and this intelligence is the basis of people's suffering. If you remove half the brain, most of them will be peaceful. <laughs> Yes or no? <laughs> it depends on which half, mind you <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're the expert, you must tell me. <laughs> you know, you yeah. know in mental yeah. asylum… Uh, the lobotomy, there he goes, that's what he's about to talk about. Yeah, you, when you knock off the lobotomy, uh, the lobotomy, I forget what it is, they knock off in your brain, you basically become emotionless. And I don't know if you… I don't think you get anger, I don't think you get anger or happiness at all, you just… it's like you're just a robot. When people are completely out of control, they are doing lobotomy, remove part of the brain, they become peaceful. Well, it's like a very small so section right of the brain now, too. Just to be peaceful and happy is such a huge challenge for most human beings huh. simply because they are not able to conduct the, the sparkle of their own intelligence. If they were little dumber, <laughs> they would be peaceful. <laughs> yes. So the problem is… Ignorance is bliss. <sighs> that's an old saying and that's what he's kind of saying. <laughs> you know, not knowing something makes you bliss. It's not of… the problem is of plenty. The problem is not of paucity, it is just that a certain level of intelligence which we are not able to handle because there is no stable platform. There is an intelligence here for which there is no stable platform. Unless you create a stable enough platform, this intelligence will not become… will not work for us, it'll work against us simply because it's a sharp knife. If you don't know how to hold it, it'll cut you up. Why we do not give a knife to a child's hand is not because knife is dangerous, because child's hand is not steady enough, he could become dangerous to himself or to somebody. So this process of perception and understanding and consciousness, all these things are questions being asked by the intellect. The intellect is always looking at the world only in pieces, in bits and pieces because all the information that comes to the intellect is coming through sense organs and sense organs perceive everything only by comparison. Without context, they cannot perceive anything. Hmm, wow, okay, yeah, that's true. <coughs> So basically, to not see and see, con uh, contrasting, uh, contexting, uh, context, because the context of being able to see, to so not see, to hear, not hear, taste, not taste, and then then you can that's that's just the base level. Then you, then seeing comes with different colors. So basically, not seeing it, no light, and then all light, the base level, and then from there you can chop it down to like red light green light, blue light, and all that, taste and not taste, saying, oh, I don't taste anything, then you put something in your mouth, oh, I've tasted it, then you taste sweet, bitter, sour, etc. And hearing the different pitches and all that. For example, if I touch this <coughs> glass, it feels cool to me. It is not that I know what is happening with this glass, it is just that my body temperature is in a certain way, because of that I feel it's cool. Mm -hmm. If I lower my body temperature and touch this, this would be warm to mm -hmm. me. So sense organs are giving a perspective only in comparison which is useful for survival. Yeah. What this means is, suppose you're six feet tall, you stand like a tall man, you walk like a tall man, you feel like a tall man, you are a tall man. You went to another society where everybody… Yeah, I was going to say, tall. until you realize everyone else is eight feet tall <laughs> or twelve. you stand like a short man, walk <laughs> like a short man, feel like a short man, you are a short man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying this perspective of compari knowing everything by comparison is only useful for survival process. Now that science, science in its essence is interested in knowing, not about enslaving the world. How to use it is not the question. How to know this 
is just an intrigue that from nowhere we just pop up and full-scale drama and suddenly we pop out and don't know what. For this we have simplistic answers. Okay, you will go to heaven, okay, you will yes. go to hell, the people mm -hmm. that you don't like will go to hell, <laughs> of course you and me will go to heaven. <laughs> yes. So these things are there. <clears throat> this is… we are trying to handle our ignorance with solace. Solace is what you're seeking, you must believe something. Belief is a good thing because today modern psychiatrists are here trying to solve these problems that human beings are having with their intelligence which are turned against themselves. Okay, and before he goes on, uh, he talked about uh, you must believe in something. There's another famous quote that uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting that I like is, believe in something or you'll fall for anything. I think that's how it goes. Which was very interesting. If you don't believe in anything, you will fall for anything. Essentially all human <clears throat> suffering is their own intelligence having turned against them. That's all it is. So psychiatrists are trying to handle but they can only handle one client at a time and they need a lot of furniture and all this. <laughs> a lot of but furniture. Religions and faiths have managed people for a long time. Hats off to them for that because they have given solace and balance to people for a very long time. And yeah, and that's one thing I've also heard of some time ago that religious people tend to be happier. It's not because... <laughs> My assumption on this is because they don't tend to seek out answers because they, they kind of already know the answer that God will take care of it or their, their, their deity or deities will take care of it. It's not a concern of theirs. They just live life and whether it be working, just having going to work, doing your job, coming back home with the family, and then if there's any problems, you know, God will handle it or gods or gods will handle it. But solace <clears throat> is one thing. Solution and seeking is something totally different. If you're talking about seeking to know, then belief systems are of no consequence. If solace is what you're seeking, yes, you must believe something because Instead of going to weekly psychiatrist sessions, if you simply believe something, everything will just settle down within you. It's a fantastic tool that way. This yes. Okay, um, I'm gonna actually, uh, let's see what he says here first. This is a place where I feel like science <clears throat> and mysticism have a real meeting ground. Okay, I'm gonna pause it right here, yeah, because Holy crap, yeah. I'm doing better though, mind you. So yeah, well, yeah. again, the thing he last said there, it is quite true. It's, it's so interesting to know that people who want to know things, who seeks real answers, don't tend to have happier lives than people who are religious. It's, it's very interesting to me. But I think it's because they're not... Hand this is um, from me personally, I guess. Even though I'm not religious, I tend to live a, a decently happy life. I would, I would like to think. Uh, I mean, I'm not out there seeking. An I seek answers, but it's not to a point where it becomes a hindrance to me. So, and I'd have no problem saying I don't know, and I have no problem giving my opinion and telling people, please do your research. This is merely my opinion on things, because. The way I believe in doing things is listening to everyone, hearing everyone's opinion and seeing where the majority lies and never never saying or thinking that the majority is right, but just to think like, okay, most people believe this. Why? I'm not sure. Or why? Well, this person is because of this, this person because of that. And unless it's an absolute true fact or fiction, it's going to be, it's not going to be either one. Uh, what I mean by that is like, one plus one is two, that is a fact. But how someone feels about a person and based on the actions they've done, it's not something that's fact or fiction because the way that one person feels about that person may be completely different from another person. So it's, it's about what most people feel about a person, but it's not generally always going to be right. It's all a matter of pers uh, perspective. I don't know where it's going with all that. Jesus, I said so much and I, I keep forgetting, but but yes, it's it's Yes, okay, the the belief, that's right. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know. Anyways. 
So this is the this is the end of part three. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.